Alright, so this week we're going to be talking about effect sizes, and I have split the lectures up into two parts. I know that effect sizes are not the most fun subject to talk about when we're talking about stats, and they're a little bit hard to swallow, so I have made it easy on you and split them up. So we're going to take it one step at a time. So part one, we're just going to focus on the introduction to effect sizes. So what exactly is an effect size? So we're talking about um, two different terms that are used in different ways by different people. So we have what's called treatment effects and then we have effect sizes. So in the field of medicine, meta-analyses often refer to the effect size as a treatment effect. They are gonna often use effect sizes like odds ratios, risk ratios, or even risk differences. Um, in the social sciences, meta-analyses actually refer to the effect size as an effect size, and they're often going to use standardized mean differences or correlations. Those are the most common ones in the social sciences area. But essentially, though, the difference between these terms is going to be in the nature of the study that you're doing. So the term effect size is going to be appropriate when you are quantifying the relationship between two variables that you're looking at or if you're looking at difference between groups. Whereas treatment effect is going to be appropriate when you're quantifying the impact of an intervention. So there are three major things that actually go into choosing an effect size. So the first of which, effect sizes from different studies need to be comparable to one another. So they need to be measuring the same thing. So the data that you're collecting across studies needs to be measuring something similar. So they need to be looking at the same construct. Secondly, estimates of the effect size should be computable from the information that's reported in the article. So you shouldn't be pulling the raw data and having to reanalyze things. Um, sometimes when this happens in full meta-analyses, you might see the, the author's reference in their publication. We had to contact um, the original authors for studies X, Y, and Z in order to get the raw data to do more calculations because they just didn't report the stats that they were supposed to report. Hopefully you're not going to be doing that. Um, and you're generally going to standardize the effect size if you're combining data from different types of measures. And lastly, the effect size should have good technical properties to it. So you need to know that this, you need to know the standard error so that you can actually calculate the variance and the confidence intervals, which give you your effect size weights. So relevant effect size categories. So these are the three most common that we're going to be talking about for the purposes of this class. But also these are the three most common effect sizes across meta-analyses in the world. So when studies report means and standard deviations, the preferred effect size is either going to be a raw mean difference, a standardized mean difference, or a response ratio. But again, for the purposes of this class, we're going to heavily focus on the standardized mean difference, and I'll explain why in just a moment. So when we're looking at a standardized mean difference, we are looking at group contrast research. So we're either looking at treatment versus control, or we're looking at naturally occurring groups, so different groups that are looking at pre-post. Um, so again, this effect size is going to be used when studies use different instruments to measure the same construct. So they might be looking at the changes in PTSD over time, but one study might have used a particular measure versus a different measure in another study. And so if they use different measures, we can still combine them into what's called a standardized mean difference. So you're looking at contrasts between groups that are presented in the form of differences between the mean values on some variable for each group. 
Secondly, we have odds ratios, and this one is a little bit more complicated to understand. We won't get into how the interpretation works until later in the semester, but again here, um, we're looking at group contrast research, so either treatment versus control, or we're looking at naturally occurring groups. So this is used when you're comparing two groups in terms of the relative odds of an event. So um, the most relevant for us is going to be thinking about forensic populations, and this comes up in forensic populations and meta-analyses. Um, so what is the likelihood of someone recidivating? This is the type of effect size we would use for that question. And so this is applicable to research findings that are using dichotomous variables. And so they're, the data is going to be presented as either frequencies or proportions, and they're going to be in tables. So usually we see this data in two by two tables. So you'll see group one and group two, and then on the other side of the table you'll see did they recidivate, did they not recidivate, um, and then those rates in those four squares. So here, again, with an odds ratio, you're likely looking at the effectiveness of a treatment as defined by recidivism. So how many times did somebody go out and recidivate after they engaged in treatment for a period of time? To where is it really showing more support for the treatment group or for the control group? And then lastly, we have correlation coefficients. So here we're looking at the association between variables, and this is used when you're examining specifically the relationship between two specific variables that you've identified and that you want to look at. So for mean differences, there are two broad relevant categories for this um, type of effect size. So we have raw mean differences, and then we also have standardized mean differences. I'll just briefly touch on raw mean differences, but it's going to be highly unlikely that we'll use this in this class and in social sciences research, and I'll explain why. So a raw mean difference is going to be used when all the studies used the same measure to measure the same construct. So if we think about this from a practical perspective, this is never going to happen unless there's only one measure for that construct in existence. So let's say there was only one measure that looked at depression. Our literature would be limited in the ability to measure that, and so every researcher would have to use that particular instrument in their study. And if that was the case, then we'd be using a raw mean difference to summarize all the effect sizes into a summary effect size. But that's not very common in the social sciences. And so what we see more commonly is a standardized mean difference in meta-analyses. And so this is what happens when we're looking at independent groups, matched groups, or we have pre-post designs. And again, researchers use different instruments across different studies, and so we're able to pull those together and still compute an effect size. So here we're going to be looking at Cohen's D versus Hedges G. So this is how a standardized mean difference is presented <clears throat> in a meta-analysis. So Cohen's D is the most commonly used effect size when looking at standardized mean differences. Um, but just to tell you a little bit of the history behind this, you don't need to know too much. Um, you'll learn a little bit about this for your final presentation, just so that you understand some of like, the stats behind it. But um, Cohen's D is actually a little bit biased. Um, Cohen's D actually tends to overestimate the absolute value of the standardized mean difference in small samples. And so what a lot of researchers will do in meta is they typically remove that bias just by using a simple correction, and this involves converting the Cohen's D to a Hedges G. Um, I won't get into too much of that here, but again, um, Hedges G is less biased for the standardized mean difference. Um, so again, it corrects for the sample size piece of that, and then you can see the two formulas there that you will actually become intimately familiar with. 
on calculation assignment one for this week. So um, keep those calculations in mind, but those are calculations that are used to help make that correction. Here are a number of formulas that you're going to be using this week for the calculation assignments, hint, hint. So you might want to come back to this slide as well as the slide before it. Actually, no, you can stay on this slide because we have both J and G values here, which you'll especially need for calculation assignment one. <coughs> All right. And so now let's look at how we calculate a standardized mean difference. <coughs> Pardon me. So we can actually use a variety of different sources of data to calculate this type of effect size. So the most common are listed here, but there's actually maybe 30 different ways that you can actually calculate this because inevitably researchers are going to present different data in different studies. We all have so many different statistical ways of doing this. Some of us like to do it in a sophisticated manner. Some of us like to do it in a simple manner. <coughs> the fact of the matter is we just need the data. So we need to know that we're probably going to have to be pulling different types of data to get our summary effect size <coughs> across studies. So the best possible scenario that we could have is having our means, standard deviations, and the ends for each group. We could also compute it if we had the independent samples t-test. So if we had the ends and the t-value or the ends and the p-value, that could also work. If we had an ANOVA, so if specifically if we had the f-value, the means and the ends for all the groups, we could also estimate an effect size. If we had a point by serial correlation, and also if we had a fee coefficient. So degrees of approximation. So when we have to calculate an effect size, we should think about the degree to which we are estimating the effect. So there's going to be a level of approximation or accuracy to this depending on the data that we use. So if we make a direct calculation based on the most commonly and best data that we can find, which you know could be means and standard deviations, having the t-test data, having the correlation coefficient, sort of those main types of data that I just presented to you on the previous slide, we've generally done a great job and the approximation is going to be pretty darn good because we're using their raw data. If we have to use estimates of the mean difference, so in other words, we have to do some finagling with the data in order to calculate the effect size because they didn't give us the type of raw data that we need to do these calculations, um, this then becomes less reliable and it's only good in this instance because we're making estimates because we're having to pool the standard deviations in order to get some of these calculations. And so it's just not as good. And the same happens if we have to make estimations based on dichotomous data. So now let's talk about binary data. So this would be looking at an odds ratio. So for this effect size, we can also use a number of different types of data to calculate an effect size here. So again, here's the most common that we're going to see. A 2 by 2 frequency table is one of the most common. So if we're thinking about recidivism, we're going to have group one, group two, so probably treatment group, control group, and then our events are going to be recidivated or didn't recidivate. And the data is going to be in those frequency tables. We could also use a phi coefficient or a chi-square as well. And, which we'll learn in the part two of the lecture, and you'll also learn in calculation assignment two, we can actually convert between effect sizes, which is an even crazier concept because sometimes um, you can express these constructs with different effect sizes. Granted, it's not as helpful if it's presented in different effect sizes. And for us to use it in a meta, we need to make sure that we are using the same effect size. So we can't 
summarize half of our articles in a standard mean difference and then half of our articles in an odds ratio, we can't even come to a conclusion. So if we end up having data that gives us a standardized mean difference effect size, we can then convert that into an odds ratio and then we can have all odds ratio data, if that makes sense. All right. And so the direction of the effect size, this is actually very, very critical to this process. Luckily, if you're using CMA, which is the software that we'll use to compute your data, which I own and we will run your analysis in, you actually don't have to worry about this because the program has this built in to detect automatically which direction it should go because it's detecting that on its own. But for the sake of you learning the importance of this concept, um, I'll just talk about this briefly. So you need to make sure that the direction is the same as you continue to calculate this for your meta. So for example, if you decide that a positive direction means that the treatment did better than the control group, then if you're seeing that the treatment group showed greater reductions in, let's say, PTSD symptoms than the control group, then you need to make sure that you assign that effect direction as positive. And let's say that you have another article in your meta that you saw that the control group actually showed greater reductions in PTSD symptoms than the treatment group. Oops, hopefully that doesn't happen, but it does. Um, so let's say you saw that, then that means that for that you would set the effect direction to be negative here because that's the exact opposite premise of what you previously defined. All right, so that ends the part one to the lecture. And before we finish this lecture, I'm actually going to show you the online calculator that you're going to be using for these assignments. So here's the effect size calculator. And there's a link to this on the Moodle page on our week three. You'll see that here there are the three different types of effect sizes that we're going to use in the class that you can calculate. So if you look here and click on standardized mean difference, here are all the different ways that you can type in data and get a standardized mean difference. So like I said, our best case scenario, we end up with means, standard deviations, and the ends of each group for the treatment and control. We can then calculate the effect size here. And you'll just enter those in in each area and then hit calculate. And then if you need to reset and re-enter in data, you can just hit the reset button there. And so here you just click and see the different types of data that you can enter in to get a standardized mean difference. Same thing with a correlation coefficient. There are a lot less possibilities here for calculating a correlation coefficient. Okay, and then we have odds ratio as well. All right, so that ends the first part and I'll see you shortly for part two.